Welcome everybody. I'm Tobin Arthur with Angel MD, and we are very pleased to have you join us tonight for a pitch club session focused on gastroenterology and urology. We've got three great startups uh, that are going to share with us this evening, and we welcome your feedback and participation. And again, thanks for joining us. A little bit about Pitch Club. This has become a favorite of our membership. And every two weeks we host these events. We encourage you to join us for all of them. We do do a follow-up email uh, tomorrow where we will have the video captured, uh, both the individual companies as well as the entire event. And then some helpful links that we'll mention throughout the evening. Our host as always, and the producer of the show is Dr. Katie Richardson. Uh, Katie, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Tobin. Welcome, everyone. We have a great evening. Um, originally built as uh, Pitch Club Gastroenterology, we actually expanded the night to Pitch Club Gastroenterology and Urology. So um, excited to have three amazing companies here uh, to present tonight. And we also have another company that we have pre-recorded for our Pitch Club extension video that I hope you all take a look at as well. There's a lot of opportunities for our clinician network tonight and a lot of asks from our companies. Again, they're going to value your feedback and um, everything that you give to them, they take to heart. And so I just want to let folks know that um, we're excited to have you all here. And we're without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So our first presenter tonight is Dr. Steven Steinberg, and he is the founder and president of a company called Endosound. Dr. Steinberg, you can go ahead and share your slides and uh, take it away. Katie, thanks very much. Can everybody see my slide set? We can. Great, thank you. So Endosound was founded with the idea of democratizing uh, endoscopic ultrasound. We're anxious to have endoscopic ultrasound, a critical technology everywhere, anywhere that endoscopy is done. And we're not advancing. There we go. So endoscopic ultrasound is this an imaging technology like, C like CT scanning and MRI, same concept. If you can see something, you can diagnose it and you can do something. Traditional ultrasound offers you visions like the one over here on the upper right that shows the, um, the mom's belly with a baby in place. And we take the same technology, put it on the end of an endoscope and get images like the one on the lower right from the inside of the body where we can visualize structures that are much closer at hand like the pancreas here and the tumor that show. Endoscopic ultrasounds become a critical technology for the diagnosis of a variety of disorders, particularly those of the pancreas and for staging of a whole host of carcinomas prior to treatment planning. We do as many as a million of these procedures a year, of which 95% are outpatient. I personally contribute about 1,000 of these procedures each year myself. Medicare has designated a code for endoscopic ultrasound, so we do not have the obstacle of finding a billing capability for this technology. It already exists. So what's the problem with legacy systems? The legacy systems shown here include a big box solution for the beam former, and a designated endoscope that has a transducer on the end of it. This combination is a $450,000 lift, which is a big ask these days in a time of uh, limited capital budgets. If that weren't enough, there's an infection risk that is conferred by a design flaw in these endoscopes for which the FDA has issued a, a recall for all of Olympus's echo endoscopes. Lastly, in the COVID era, decreased capital budgets make the ability to do um, capital purchases a much difficult uh, circumstance. So what's our solution? We developed a technology that allowed us to add this device to a standard 
upper endoscope, converting it to a fully functional EUS scope. A little jerky here. And in doing so, we can do all of the procedures and more that our standard scopes can do. This conversion can be done in something under five minutes and takes this standard scope found everywhere in endoscopy units and converts it into a fully functional scope, transducer mounted here and control wheel here, allowing us to move the transducer and obtain different images. The key innovation here was the ability to have a needle exit the channel of the upper scope and come into the field of view of the transducer so that one can target and take samples of, in this case, a pancreatic tumor. That technology yielded the patents awarded, several patents pending, and filings in all of the significant countries around the world. So who wins? The physician who performs endoscopic ultrasound gets reimbursed at twice the rate of upper endoscopy and colonoscopy, so the docs win. The insurers, the governments, and patients experience a lower cost. The migration of about 600,000 of these cases to surgery centers would yield half a billion dollars in new business to those units. And that benefits all of us because those encounters cost $1,500 per episode less than the same encounter when it occurs in a hospital. From End of Sound's point of view and its investors, there's a $300 million total available market, and we estimate a five-year revenue in excess of $100 million. This is our timeline. We have our patents issued. We have distribution partners that have expressed letters of intent, and we have other partners that have expressed interest in potential participation and even takeouts. We finished proof of concept. We have four animal trials that have been successful that were staffed by 11 of the key and most important KOLs around the country in this area. Our human trials are upcoming, and we have FDA breakthrough designation by virtue of the fact that we eliminate the infection risk of the legacy scopes, and we hope to have approval and a launch in the third quarter of 2022. Our funding to date has been self-funded in the pre-seed round so that we have no debt. We've just finished a $1.5 million seed feed that appears to be oversubscribed, and we may well be looking for an additional round later this year in the amounts of approximately $3.5 million, although we're hoping actually to get to FDA approval without further dilution. Our team is experienced with gray hair everywhere. I've been doing this for the better part of 40 years and have served as a key opinion leader for most of the uh, significant strategics in the space. My partner, Scott Corbett, trained at, the at the Penn State, which is ground zero for ultrasound technology in the US. That's where sonar started, the anti-submarine technology in the early 40s, and all of the key players uh, in the field have come from this area. In addition, we've got a seasoned team in the area of marketing and development as well, and QA as well. And so we're poised to leap into this space. What's our ask tonight? Our ask tonight is to look for fellow travelers in the form of gastroenterologists and people interested in the technology and also ASC administrators who may be interested in partnering and finding a new service line to augment their revenues. Thanks very much for joining in and look forward to your questions. Great, Steve, thanks, thanks so much for being here and telling us all about Endosound. Um, for those of you that are in our audience tonight, we would love to take your questions and you can put those in the Q&A function of chat but while we're waiting on that, I actually have a few questions for you myself. It seems like this technology has other kind of use cases and, and indications. Can you talk more about some of those? So uh, EUS, is, as I mentioned, is critical in the area of cancer treatment and diagnosis. So you pretty much can't have a cancer center without having endoscopic ultrasound available. And further, because it provides us a view of areas of the body that aren't otherwise easily uh, accessed, 
we can do abscess drainages, we can do treatments with biologicals, we can do a whole host of things that aren't otherwise available, for example, utilizing MRI or CT scan. So it's really become a key technology in our armamentarium in, in this arena. Great. Um, and another question from our audience here, uh, is the entire device reusable? Or are there any disposable pieces other than the need um, that can create a recurring revenue stream? And yeah. maybe with this question, you can talk a little bit about your business model. So if we looked at the device here, the device, the portions of the device that are movable, which is to say the control wire and the control mechanism and mounting, those are disposable. So this is the razor blade part of the business model. The transducer, which is a bit more expensive, has been designed so that it is easily and readily cleaned, eliminating the infection risk. And so we have, in this case, a hybrid model. We anticipate ultimately as transducer prices plummet that this would ultimately be a totally disposable device, but we're not quite there yet. The business model is one that says we can move 600,000 procedures that doctors currently perform in the hospital under adverse conditions. There's nothing like going to do a procedure and being bumped for some VIP's gallbladder operation and then having to wait three hours. If the doc can do it in their own surgery center, remember docs own these surgery centers, they not only enjoy the additional revenue, but they enjoy, but they enjoy the extraordinary efficiencies of working in their own space and being in control of their time and, and the conditions under which their patients are seen. Great. Um, and one of our audience members had a question that I also had, so I'm excited that this one came up. Talk about how this technology helps reduce um, the infection risk and or contamination that has plagued the legacy systems. So uh, if you look at this image here, this duodenoscope is also the scope that we use for the procedure called ERCP. And this is the one that, uh, that got into trouble at UCLA with deaths from carbenicillin resistant enterobacter. And it has the design floor here, which is this elevator. It's a movable, pivotable piece of metal that is used to deflect devices. And it's extraordinarily difficult to clean. And so that's where the bugs were harbored. Endoscopic ultrasound devices have exactly the same elevator to deflect the needle. And therein have the same infection risk and have uh, garnered the same recall. Our design doesn't have that movable piece. So the needle comes out, there is no deflecting device, there is nothing that is difficult to clean or isn't thrown away. Great, thank you for explaining that because I think that's an important question, clearly. Um, a couple of other great questions. Since all GI specialists don't perform endoscopic ultrasound, do you also plan on doing training for general GI docs um, to help train them in this uh, using your technology and in this procedure? And then also any plans to expand into pulmonary and other such markets? So the first question is an excellent one. If you were to look at the ASGE, the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopies website, you'd find that training sessions for endoscopic ultrasound are oversubscribed. And so, and these are by physicians out in the out in practice, and as I think anybody who's a doc out there who does procedures know, it's not so easy to pick up new skills when you're already in practice and you're having to either take time or to get back to uh, some central site for additional training. So we would expect and plan to participate in the ASGE's activities. We're a part of the, um, the ASGE SIG Special Interest Group for EUS, and there's been a great deal of excitement on their part to add us to their offerings in that regard. The second I question, I'm sorry? I was just gonna say, I love it. That sounds awesome. And the second question was in regard to- Ex second part. Uh, Plans to expand into pulmonary oh. and other such markets. Yeah, and so um, we're interested in uh, uh, expanding into the laparoscopy market. Pulmonary represents a little bit of a challenge because of the sizing. One needs to get, needless to say, things smaller to get into a trachea and into bronchi. Um, we think that we can do that, but um, as with all startups, our goal is to shoot the engineer and get the product out the door. 
And that's what we're up to right now. And so our focus is in getting the GI indications up and running. And then uh, we've got all kinds of other ideas on the drawing board that we're itching to get to, but we're really trying to focus. Great. And one last question for you. Um, I think this is another great question. Um, again, one, one that we had from our perspective as well, but what's the competitive landscape like and what is to stop the big players like Olympus um, to create competitive products, um, especially with their big R&D budgets? And can you talk a little bit more about your IP and your patents and, and how that's um, gonna prevent that from happening? Sure, so the, the IP is basically around the ability to get that, that needle out of a channel that does not have an elevator and to get it into an ultrasound field of view. And so we believe, at least according to our uh, uh, intellectually property lawyers, uh, that we've got pretty good protection around the, um, the approach that we have taken. We've generated a number of other picket fence uh, obstacles, if you will, in terms of additional IP aimed at circumventing other ways that one might do this. And so I think, um, uh, we feel pretty confident that we're in a good space. The first part of your question was com competition. There currently isn't any that we are aware of. There isn't anybody other than the big box solutions out there. Um, as you know, and I think everybody out there knows that uh, if somebody tries to invade your space, um, there's always a potential risk for that. We're hoping that our IP will at least make that a difficult lift. Great. Again, Dr. Steinberg, thank you so much um, for being here this evening and telling us all about Endosound. So now we are on to company number two this evening. And I am excited to introduce Dr. Parak God, who is the co-founder and CEO of a company called SpineX. And Parak, I would just make sure you unmute and then you're ready to go. All right, can you guys see the slides okay? Perfect. All right, thank you, Katie and uh, Mike for having me on, on this platform. It's nice to present to you all. Uh, my name is Parak Gard. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Spinex. The problem you're solving is one that a lot of individuals take for granted until it is an issue that you face yourself. Yes, we're talking about urinary incontinence. Urinary incontinence impacts about one in three women and about one in 14 men uh, with the rate of incidence increasing with age, totaling about 33 million individuals. In addition, there's a, a, a whole group of individuals suffering from a condition called neurogenic bladder. These are ones that suffer from paralysis of some sort, spinal cord injury, stroke, uh, totaling about 40 million in America suffering from overactive bladder. In Europe, the total is about 25 million, world over about 550 million. Now, the American Neurological Association recommends a four-pronged approach to treat urinary incontinence, beginning with behavioral therapies, uh, followed by medications, uh, invasive and non-invasive unit modulation, and finally, augmentation surgery. Now, each of these you know, comes with an increasing level of costs and risks associated with it. However, they also come with multiple limitations. Medications, for example, uh, has uh, significant side effects, you know, one of them being dry mouth. To resolve dry mouth, you've got to drink more water. You drink more water, you are going to leak more often. Uh, and because of which about 80% of the individuals actually discontinue medications after trying it. Posterior tibial nerve stimulation or PTNS, a popular third level neuromodulation therapy done in the clinic has only about 50% of the people that actually respond to it. In addition, it is not approved for neurogenic cases and it does not lead to any changes in sensation or bladder capacity. Botox on the other hand is effective, but it leads to increased risks of retention and urinary tract infection. So none of them are actually solving the problem. They're just managing symptoms. Introducing SCONE, spinal cord neuromodulator. The first of its kind, wearable, portable, non-invasive electrical stimulator that can reactivate and retrain the spinal circuits that control data function. We've taken a complicated problem of integrate in interacting waveforms and built it into a sophisticated wearable device to treat an important problem. By placing these little hydrogel electrodes along specific levels along the back, we send in low intensity electrical pulses. 
these electrical pulses retrain the circuits that contain the intrinsic control for bladder and sphincter uh, function. Now, by setting in these pulses, we reduce the spasticity in the bladder, increase the tone in the sphincter, and uh, it acts as a hearing aid by allowing the, the brain or the cortex to increase the sensory signal of bladder fullness. Third, by activating the lumbosacral spinal networks that control bladder function le leads to neuroplasticity, thereby reducing incontinence and increasing bladder capacity while improving sensation. Therapy sessions are absolutely painless, last for about an hour a day, two to four days a week, over a period of 12 weeks. Patients start to respond uh, by, by session six and continue to improve over the course of the 12 weeks. Now, how is it that we are actually able to stimulate the spinal cord without causing any pain or discomfort? That's because of these interacting waveforms with a high frequency that creates an analgesic effect on the skin and the second uh, frequency that actually penetrates and activates the spinal cord. As you can see from the traces from uh, urodynamic catheters placed in the bladder and sphincter, the stimulation can actually result in contractions in the bladder and sphincter. Now, when delivered, uh, when delivered, uh, we're able to fine tune the activation specifically to the bladder and the sphincter based on the site and intensity of stimulation. Now, when delivered chronically over a period of weeks, we're able to change the plasticity in the spinal and brain networks, resulting in modifications in the neurodynamic cycles. As you can see from the, uh, the trace on the right, the bladder capacity increases, the level of control increases, as well as the overall flow is, is more efficient with a higher avoiding efficiency. What's important to note here is that both of these traces were in the absence of stimulation, suggesting that an actual neuroplasticity is being induced in the spinal and brain networks. What's also important to note here is that we're able to sustain the level of function over an extended period of time, weeks after therapy has stopped. In, an on, in a previous clinical study published last year, we were able to demonstrate a 11 point change in the neurogenic bladder symptom score in patients uh, with spinal cord injury, stroke, or MS and overactive bladder. Now, this trans Related to a 70% uh, reduction in incontinence episodes. The neurogenic bladder symptom score is a metric of overall bladder health. In an ongoing study in patients with overactive bladder that were on medication, we had them been off medication and after delivering therapy for 12 weeks, we were able to observe a 15 point change in the neurogenic bladder symptom score, which translated to an 80% reduction in incontinence and a four times increase in zero urge void. Now, so the patients can actually. Um, enjoy all the benefits of improved function without any of the side effects of the medication. We've been active since 2019, where we raised a small friends and family round that allowed us to complete product development of our Alpha device, initiate feasibility studies in the overactive bladder field. Um, since then, we have been able to raise, uh, receive grants to the order of about two and a half million dollars from NIH, as well as through other foundations that has allowed us to complete development of our clinical MVP device as well as begin our validation study later this year that will lead to our 510K by early 2023. So it's, it's, we have been able to run a really lean machine with zero uh, venture funding so far. Uh, the second phase of our uh, development would be a 510K where the therapy can then be delivered in the home environment and patients wouldn't have to come into the clinic. IP was filed in early 2019, and this covers the novel waveforms that allow us to activate the spinal cord without causing any pain or discomfort to the patients. We expect to file additional IP later this year and early next year. We should cover generation two and three of our device, including a closed loop system for optimization of the stimulation. But we are not an overactive data company. We are a spinal neuromodulation company. SCONE is a platform technology that can be used for multiple indications. And we already have uh, critical data from multiple uh, you know, indications beginning with cerebral palsy and the impact that it can have on the children with CP. We have a small but highly motivated team led by Dr. Reggie Edgerton, who's considered as the father of spinal neuromodulation, has been working at UCLA for over 50 years. Dr. Evgeny Creden, a trained neurourologist leading our clinical efforts. Mr. Tim Hopper, a medical device executive with over 25 years of experience, and myself as co-founding CEO and a, someone who's translated the technology all the way from uh, rodents now to humans. And with that, I thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. Barack, thank you um, for being here tonight and telling us all about this technology. Um, you know, I'm a pediatrician, and so we, we don't deal with a lot of neurogenic bladder, 
Um, but what but what I would say is this seems like a game changer um, and, and super exciting for a lot of patients that um, deal with this type of issue. So one question from my perspective, because again, in my mind, I think, wow, I mean, we're, we're talking, sounds like neuroplasticity, brain, spinal cord, all of these things, which we know exist and yet it's still hard to believe. So tell us a little bit more about the neurophysiology of the technology. Like how, how and why does this work? Because again, it seems like a game changer. The, the basic uh, principle behind this is that the spinal cord is smart. We give a lot of importance to the brain and assume that the brain is controlling every aspect of our life. Uh, there's, a, there's a key term that we use in, in, in neurophysiology called automoticity. Everything we do is automatic, including bladder function. The bladder is controlled by you know, the spinal cord to a large extent. Um, you know, if, imagine a, a, a one-year-old who's got a healthy bladder and bowel function, and they you know, hold empty on, you know, based on when, they, when they, it reaches the fullness. Um, the, in, in the case of uh, an adult, you empty it you know, volitionally uh, only when it is socially acceptable. So that, that's the basic concept here that we are tapping into. Now, after a dysfunction, such as a stroke or spinal cord injury, or even after OAB, it, the, the circuitry in the spinal cord is dormant or is not, is not, is not dead. We have identified way, ways in which we can reactivate these circuits by placing these electrodes along the spinal cord and not cause any pain or discomfort to the in individuals. That's the basic you know, underlying principle that we are capitalizing on. Great. Again, um, a, a little bit mind blowing. Um, a couple of questions from our audience related to your clinical data. And I, I think this is great. So um, one of them really is about the durability of your outcomes. So talk a little bit uh, about one, it seems like small patient sizes and talk about how long you followed them and what you anticipate needing for your FDA clearance in the future. So yeah, these are these are first in human studies that we've conducted so far. And you know, about maybe we've tested this in about twenty odd patients, uh, but the, the results are are durable with over ninety percent of patients responding positively. Uh, but yeah, in addition, they are the response rate is high as well as the level of response is better than what's what's been seen in you know the current clinically approved devices. Um, that in terms of durability. Uh, we, have, we have trained patients over a period of about three months or 12 weeks. And after stopping the therapy, patients are able to sustain it for at least three months after it's stopped. So we know there's the therapy is durable. Uh, we anticipate you know, future studies where we'll explore the use of a maintenance therapy, similar to what PTNS currently does, where patients may receive therapy once a month or twice a month just to maintain that level of function. All right, fantastic. So um, a couple of questions about how does this technology actually differ from sacral stimulation, um, except for the fact that it's and or interstim devices, except for the fact that this is non-invasive. So talk a little bit about that. The, the key difference between uh, our approach and sacral neuromodulation lies on two fronts. The first, apart from it being non-invasive, the first, we are able to activate the spinal cord directly. Sacral neuromodulation stimulates the S2, S3 nerves, or the nerve roots rather, and those then you know, has some ascending and descending control that reaches the bladder. In our uh, in, uh, approach by activating the spinal cords directly, those are the neural networks that control bladder and sphincter function that we're able to reactivate. That's the first key difference. The second is because of the ability to activate the spinal cord directly, we're able to induce neuroplasticity in the brain and the spinal cord, and that leads to long-term changes that can be seen even when the stimulation is turned off. Wow. Um, you know, we, we have some very positive comments from our audience about, again, the potential of this technology. A couple of additional questions on potential side effects and or um, safety experience around this type of treatment. So we've had you know, this technology tested at, in clinical studies at UCLA and other universities now, and we've, we've uh, experienced over 200 patients for different you know, studies, not just bladder function, and you know, seen absolutely no adverse events. The only side effect that we've seen is a uh, you know, uh, little bit of redness around the skin, uh, and that's similar to any FPS or TENS unit that you would you know, use otherwise for pain relief. And that redness goes away in about half an hour or so. Great. 
Um, so a couple of other questions. Um, talk a little bit more about your IP and then are there other competitors that are using this approach uh, of spinal neuromodulation? Sure, the, the IP that we have essentially covers our uh, novel waveforms that we use to reactivate the spinal circuits without causing the pain or discomfort I talked about. It covers uh, the ability to activate the brain and spinal cord to specifically target the bladder and sphincter. Uh, it, it covers an, um, uh, smart wearable devices so that we can integrate the device and the electrodes into a chair, integrate it into a shirt and integrate it into a wearable device so that we can make it easy for patients to use. Uh, there are uh, competitors in the field that target uh, overactive bladder. You know, there's Blue Wind, there's Valencia Technologies that does peripheral stimulation of tibial nerve, either implantable or semi-implantable. Uh, no one's doing this on the spinal cord front. Uh, so that, that, that gives us first mover advantage. In addition, everyone's focusing primarily on the overactive bladder market and not so much in the neurogenic population. So you know, that's where our, our you know, current focus is. So that gives us again uh, a first market advantage by really carving out a niche for ourselves in the ORAC, uh, in the neurogenic uh, population. Fantastic. And one last question I just have to ask because it seems to me that there are other indications again for this type of technology. So can you tell us a little bit more about thoughts that you have around that and maybe uh, potential studies that have been done already? Sure. So we, we're leveraging the spinal cord and the smartness in the spinal cord. And, you know, we believe that the same can be uh, used to treat, uh, you know, cerebral palsy, uh, as well as improvement in function in patients that are paralyzed. So I'll briefly touch upon cerebral palsy, where um, physical therapy is considered as the, uh, you know, gold standard for treatment. Now, here's a kid that's considered a level four on the GMFM scale, trying to walk on a treadmill after having received extensive physical therapy for over six months. And you can see he is unable to do so. Now, on the same day, we introduce scone over the lumbosacral spinal cord with the same device. And you can see the difference on the right when scone is on versus on the left when he's attempting to walk without the stimulation. Now, oh. the most important thing for me here is the smile on the kid's face, being able to actually walk and just be a two-year-old. Now, similar to incontinence, uh, the level of neuropathy when you train you know, with physical therapy. Now, here's a kid again on a level four at home without stimulation, attempting to walk in his walker on the left versus eight weeks later. So just eight weeks of therapy or 16 hours of therapy on the right, successfully walking around at home with his walker. So this is not, it's not a magic portion. It's not making them perfect, but the level of independence uh, that can be restored is, huge. But that is incredible. Again, um, Parak, thank you for being here tonight and sharing with us all about Spinex and this technology. Um, I, I, I have high hopes and I love that you're also helping kids with cerebral palsy. That's super exciting. So our last but not least company of the evening, we have uh, Lauren Desjardins, who is a biomedical engineer for EnteroTrack. And EnteroTrack is a company that's known to Angel MD. They actually um, presented for us uh, back in the fall, um, but they have some exciting new updates as well as um, some new use uh, indications that they would love to tell us all about. So Lauren, I'll let you share your slides and take it away. Awesome. Thank you very much, Katie. Good deal. So. As mentioned, I'm Lauren Desjardins. I'm a biomedical engineer with EnteroTrack. We've previously pitched to AngelMD about our minimally invasive monitoring system for GI, um, upper GI that is. This method is our developed esophageal string test. This esophageal string test is used by physicians to monitor patients easily and routinely. This is done without endoscopy or biopsy and instead utilizes the Enero tracker, a small capsule that collects fluid from the upper GI tract of adults and pediatric patients. The current application of our technology is eosinophilic esophagitis or EOE, which is an inflammatory condition of the esophagus tissue. Currently, the only method to accurately diagnose and monitor these patients is endoscopy and biopsy. Although endoscopy is invasive, it has possible anesthesia side effects and is very expensive. Our technology consists of a simple collection device coupled with a companion assay. 
The patient swallows the capsule, the string unwinds to collect mucosal fluids, it's then removed, and the lab-developed test assays for the disease activity relating to the key biomarkers of esophageal inflammation in our current use case, which is MBP1 and eotoxin-3. Since we last pitched to AngelMD, our company has had several accomplishments. In 2019, our study found that 95% of parents and more than 90% of patients preferred esophageal string tests over endoscopy. We've also obtained an excellent reimbursement rate from CMS for our test and have recently closed a Series A funding round to support sales expansion of the esophageal string test for EOE. At this point, our product is currently being commercialized throughout clinics in the US where we're specifically targeting the allergist market segment. With projected sales in 2022 being between one and $2 million. We've already obtained four customer accounts with 10 soft commitments in the works. Each of the physicians have expressed utmost excitement for our tasks, particularly pediatricians. Our plan is to leverage our team's growth and expertise to explore new ventures that take advantage of our simple patented sample collection device. During the discussions that we've had with clinicians around the EOE application, we discovered there are many more upper GI disease states that are highly attractive for our product. One application particularly received universal enthusiastic feedback, screening for esophageal cancer. Esophageal cancer often presents late in the course of disease. Current diagnostics involve changes in epithelial histology. However, such techniques are not sufficiently sensitive for early stage screening which is critical since prognosis is related to stage of disease upon diagnosis. In 2022, the American Cancer Society reported 16,000 estimated deaths from esophageal cancer and an estimated 18,000 new cases. Screening for esophageal cancer and related diseases is recommended for a wide range of risk factor, including male gender, which as you can see is substantially more effective than women, GERD, advanced age, family history, obesity, and smoking. This huge patient population represented by these risk factors makes effective screening with endoscopy actually impossible. Late stage cancer diagnosis is common because of the lack of effective screening for precursor conditions and the conditions itself, such as esophageal cancer. Late stage diagnosis ultimately leads to a poor survival rate of only 20% over five years. Like EOE, endoscopy procedures are expensive, highly invasive, and requires anesthesia often. Additionally, endoscopy cannot be done at large scale to screen early and often for esophageal cancer. Large companies and smaller startups have noticed the need and have begun introducing products. The Medtronic cytosponge is an expandable sponge that scrapes the cells from the gastroesophageal junction and the esophagus, although it has several problems, including throat abrasions in 44% of patients. The PavMed collection device Isocheck has limited data and DNA yield has been shown to be low at times. Neither device can be performed at home because of its complexity and required expertise. Our method is easy to use and can be done in an at-home setting in a significant percentage of the US population. Like the EOE procedure, the device will be developed and deployed at home, and the sample will be sent to be assayed for key biomarkers of esophageal cancer. The assay for esophageal cancer screening could include proteins, methylation markers, glandular atypia, and TP53 mutation, which have all been shown to be viable for detection of patient populations that would benefit from an endoscopy. Previous studies have shown combinations of biomarkers and algorithms enable risk stratification of low, moderate, and high risk for esophageal cancer. Our focus will be surrounding the protein and methylation biomarkers based on supporting data. Combination of some of these biomarkers will yield the highest specificity and sensitivity. We have experience in collection of other biomarkers and we're confident in Enerotracker's ability to obtain esophageal cancer biomarkers. 
At this current stage, we've achieved four granted patents and one pending that surround the Enerotracker technology, which includes EOE, as mentioned, GERD, Barrett's esophagus, and esophageal cancer. We have also have clear evidence that our string device captures biomarkers associated with esophageal cancer. In an in vitro cell culture study, we showed that the Enerotracker can capture biomarkers of GERD, a precursor of Barrett's, which has been shown to progress to esophageal cancer. Upcoming activities will focus on additional capital to begin small pilot clinical studies to include proof of concept and at home use. After clinical trials are completed, we'll be seeking additional FDA clearance for the specific indication. With our growing expertise, we're planning to expand horizontally into new areas within the GI and allergy fields. For example, we've recently added clinical expertise, including Dr. Wani, a GI physician at UC Health, who is very excited about our technology. We're currently seeking opportunities to expand our clinical expertise surrounding esophageal cancer and cancer immunology. We are also seeking PCPs to support continuous frequent monitoring of patients. So if you're interested in working with us to save lives, please do reach out. Thank you. Great. Lauren, that was an exciting update. You guys are doing some really cool things. Um, and we have some great questions uh, from our audience and some of them are my same questions. So um, what one was around kind of your planned um, clinical studies and the regulatory pathway and approvals that are upcoming. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, so the Plan studies so far, uh, as mentioned, we will be hopefully hearing back about our SBIR grant soon, um, but those studies will specifically focus on in vitro biomarkers for esophageal cancer. Um, and then we'll also, we'll also focus on a survey for at home use so we can go ahead and start venturing into that specific indication. Um, and then as far as the FDA clearance goes, um, that is, still under deliberation, but likely will be a 510K as there's plenty of predicate devices, but our previous FDA clearance was actually um, just a notification. So it might even be as simple as, as something similar to what we currently have done. Very good. Um, and we have one question from the audience about the comparative accuracy versus endoscopy. And I realize you don't have this data related to the esophageal cancer screening. Can you speak to it a little bit related to how it compares in the EOE um, use case? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our EOE use case has shown extremely high specificity and sensitivity. I don't have the exact numbers for you, so that's a really wonderful question. I'd be happy to get those, those percentages for you after. Um, but it has actually shown to be almost identical to endoscopy. So we are hoping that that is going to be the same for this case. Um, but again, we, we, as you said, Katie, we don't have that data and that's kind of our, our next step. Great. Um, and another question from our audience, um, to catch esophageal cancer or to diagnose it, you need to get close to the GE junction or the gastroesophageal junction. How do you ensure that you are there with the home test? Absolutely. So the current way that we monitor kind of um, where exactly we are within the whole upper GI tract is with a pH marker. So with EOE, we... Um, cut the string a certain percent or cut a certain section of the string based on the pH um, indicated with the pH marker. So for example, the esophagus is very basic. Um, so we just cut a portion of that basic section of the string and then put it in our current um, buffer solution vial. So similarly, we can kind of tell the, the rough location of the JEG backwards. G-E-J. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I got you. Yep. <laughs> no worries. So a couple of questions around, and, and um, I just want to make sure there's clarity again about how this works. It sounds like the string is the major part of the collection device, but a lot of people want to know, um, how, how do you retrieve the capsule that's at the end? Or do you need yeah. to retrieve the capsule that's at the end? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, uh, so the capsule is a gelatin capsule. It just dissolves and is weighted with a ball bearing. So it, it kind of naturally through peristalsis strings along 
or unwinds the string, right? And then you don't have to worry about the capsule or the ball bearing inside of it. The only thing is just don't go get an MRI of the next 48 hours. But yeah, you don't have to worry about the capsule. You just pull out the string and cut it where you need to and, and send it off to be assayed. Great. Um, and, you know, one other question um, that I have. So we have the indication for eosinophilic esophagitis, as well as now this esophageal cancer screening. Again, I'm guessing this technology could also be used for other use cases and indications. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So as mentioned, currently we are focusing on EOE. We've done studies around GERD, um, as I kind of mentioned back towards the end over here, as I walk through that. Um, now we're focusing on esophageal cancer, but the next kind of phases of different areas we're looking at is nutrition. So specifically food allergy and the gut microbiome because our string actually does reach all the way through the esophagus into the stomach as well. So we'll be looking at those applications in the coming years or so. Great. So a couple of questions also um, that we'll finish with are around a little bit more around your business model. So um, one, you know, it sounds like your goal is to make this an at-home test, as you mentioned. Um, there's a question around um, why not go the CLIA lab route, home collection, send to the lab, which is exactly, I think, what you're talking about doing. And then um, how does this compare to other kind of home cancer diagnostics? And again, will it be the same type of business model related to that? Absolutely. So a really, really great comparison is the Cologuard. So this is an at-home DNA um, fecal sampling device, and, and it, they then send that off to the lab. So our model will be pretty much exactly the same. Um, we would have the patient at home swallow and then pull it out, process, send off to the lab, um, and then get their results kind of similarly. Um, and, and then as far as, you know, reimbursement and everything, we expect to be reimbursed similarly to how Cologuard is being reimbursed, but, you know, we would initially kind of leverage the physicians as it would be a prescribed device, um, and then, you know, educate patients and then ultimately obtain this, this reimbursement coverage. Um, I feel like there was another part to your question, Katie. I think um, actually, I think, I think that was it. Yep. Okay, great. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, and again, as I said, we're happy to facilitate conversations with our presenters tonight. I think you guys all did a really great job. And I look forward to seeing our um, audience members on June 8th for Pitch Club with Direct to Consumer Innovations, which will be exciting. And then on June 22nd, we have a really exciting program on healthcare innovation in the field of oncology. So please join us and thank you all for um, joining us this evening and we look forward to seeing you soon.